without re-preaching the whole message from last week, we want to bring you up to speed that the Apostle Paul and Silas and Luke were in the city of Philippi. And uh, they were sharing the gospel there. They were out on doing what evangelists do. They were out on the streets. And they, they were just telling the people about Jesus. This was a pagan city. Not too many people even believed in God. They may have believed in many gods or some sort of God, but they didn't believe in the God of the Bible. And so the news that Paul was bringing them was brand new. And when they told them that God loved them, they couldn't comprehend that too much. And when they told them about Jesus and how He came from heaven as God's Son and virgin born and lived a sinless life, when He shared the gospel message of how the sinless Son of God took their place on a cross, suffered and bled and died, was buried and rose again on the third day, and ascended to heaven and can give them eternal life and complete forgiveness of sins, some of the people just turned around and said, I've never heard anything like that, and they left. But there were others who listened. You know what? The apostle Paul was preaching the same gospel we preach today. It didn't change. It didn't need to change. The gospel's perfect. And so we just keep preaching it just like Paul did. Not as well, I promise you that. But I mean, he did preach the gospel, and that's what he was doing. And, and on, as he went through the town, there was a lady that started following him. She was, the Bible refers to her as a young damsel. That means just a young woman, and she was demon-possessed. She not only was a demon-possessed woman, but she was a slave. And she was a slave to her masters. And the masters used the demonic possession that she had because the demon gave her the ability to foretell the future. She really was a fortune teller. And because she could tell fortunes and she could tell the future, people would pay good money for this woman to tell them their future and ask her, answer their questions. Well, of course, she didn't get to keep the money. It went to the masters who owned her as a slave. And that was great until Paul cast the demon out of her. And when the demon left, her ability to tell fortunes was over. And when she could no longer do that, she could not give a penny to any of her masters. And they were furious. You see, those men, they, they didn't care about her they didn't care about her at all. They didn't care about God. They didn't care about Jesus. They didn't care about the gospel. They didn't care about heaven. They only cared about money. That was their God. And they were furious because what Paul had done in casting the demon out of her had the result of taking away their God, money. And they were absolutely furious over that. You want to get somebody mad, take away their money, particularly if there's somebody that worships God. I worship's money. <laughs> you can find out pretty fast. And so they said, we, we've got to do something about these guys. We've got to get them off the streets. So they took them before the magistrates to have them tried. And they hoped they were going to be executed, but they were not executed. Instead, well, let's just read what happened. Acts chapter 16, verse 22. It says, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes. In other words, they ripped the clothes right off of their backs, and they commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they didn't just hit them one time, they beat them again and again and again. They cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Understand, that jailer was told, you better keep these guys. Don't you dare let them escape. And he knew that if he had let them escape, he would pay with his life. So he put them as far back in the prison as he could put them. I mean the deepest, darkest part of the dungeon where there was no light shining at all. It was the worst place. It was Literally, today it would be described as a hell hole. It was that bad. And that's where they put Paul and put Silas. Why? What have they done wrong? Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. I, I got to kind of warn you that sometimes preaching Jesus often has a price. Sharing the gospel will not make everybody happy with you. There are going to be some that don't like what you have to say, particularly if it interrupts the flow of their money or their lifestyle and changes things. There's a price to be paid quite often. And sometimes when you get to the point that you're interfering with something Satan is doing, like, in, like casting out a demon, he retaliates. He will retaliate. 
He hates the gospel. He hates people who stand up for God and deliver his people. Well, like they did with the power of God. Sometimes Christians get wounded in the battle. I mean, we are in a battle. By now you've understood it if you're a Christian at all. You know you've been in a spiritual war and it's still going on. It won't quit as long as you're here. Well, Paul and Silas had started off probably with a pretty good day that morning. You know, they were bright and cheerful. Let's go out to the streets. They'll tell somebody else about Jesus and maybe somebody will be saved today. And then there, here came that woman. Well, she'd been following them for several days and it made them angry because she was just mocking them and everything else. And then they wound up where? In prison. Started off with a good day, but wound up in a very bad day in a prison cell. Many of us, if we'd been in their position, by the time we got in the back part of that prison with our feet in stocks and our backs all bloodied, we would really feel defeated. At least discouraged, just wondering how much more of this might take. Is it really worth it to be doing what we were doing to get this? Some of us would say, I didn't sign up for this part of it. I, I like the idea of going out to a block party and sharing Jesus. I, I'm blowing up balloons for little kids. I like that part. I want to cook a hot dog. I can do that. I can hand out a gospel track, but this stuff, I didn't sign up for that. Can I tell you, listen, if you do what God calls you to do, you're going to make the devil mad. We were talking about it just this morning, saying, you know what? I don't think the devil likes my sermon. I think it makes him mad. And I said, good, I want to make him mad. I don't want the devil to be happy with anything I'm preaching. Why? If I'm making him happy, I'm not pleasing God. So we need to be sure, take a stand for the Lord, and let the chips fall where they may, and let the enemy suffer. We probably would be wondering if we ought to withdraw, withdraw from the battlefield, but not Paul and not Silas. That's not what they did. Look what they did in verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. I guess so. Picture where they are. Picture what their bodies are like. Picture what they've been through. Yeah, they prayed and they did what? They sang praises. In midnight in the jail, all bloody and beaten and battered and everything else. You can't even move. Your feet are in stock. You're sitting on an edge of a sharp board. You can't stand up. You can't sit down. You can't lie down. You can't get comfortable. What are you singing praises? So that's what they did. And the prisoners heard them. Instead of crying out for sympathy, they prayed and praised God. I mean, what did they have to praise God about? After all, their, even their clothes were taken away from them, ripped off right off their backs, and their backs were bloody. They were in total darkness in the most horrible conditions. Can you imagine what that prison cell was like? They didn't sanitize them very much. They didn't sweep them or mop them at all. How many prisoners had been in there for years, we don't know. But if you can just imagine the filthiest, nastiest room in the world, that's where they were. The stench from human waste and sweat had to have been just gagging them. Rats probably running around on the ground, even though they couldn't see them, they could hear them, and they knew what they sounded like because Paul had been in prison before. They said, wow, I'm glad I wasn't in that prison. But you know what? Sometimes we can find similar circumstances in our worlds today. In the world that we live in, we can say, well, it's not quite that bad, but sometimes we're, we're in a place where we're in a dark spot too. We, we've been put someplace we don't want to be. We can't see any light. And, and, and sometimes we can hear people around us moaning and groaning because surely they heard the other prisoners because the other prisoners could hear them when they were singing praises. I'm sure the other prisoners weren't praising God. They were crying, cursing, moaning. That's what they were listening to. Our world's like that a lot. We're, we're, we're the people around us, are, sometimes there's a lot the same way that, that they're caught in a prison and maybe they didn't make it themselves and didn't want to be there, but somehow they wound up in a prison that they didn't create. You know people like that. They're trapped and they can't run away. They'd like to run away, but they, it's like having their feet in stocks. They, they just can't move. I'm stuck in this situation. It's bad. It's terrible. I don't know how to get out of it. Can't do anything to change their circumstances. And all they can do is cry and curse and moan. 
Worse conditions couldn't be imagined for Apostle Paul and Silas, let alone the other prisoners. What they, how did they handle it? They prayed. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they prayed. Trapped in the darkness, no way out, surrounded by all of that stuff and all that filth and the nastiness and the sounds in their ears and everything else. It's terrible where they were. But if that describes your world even a little bit, listen to me carefully, you can do the same thing they did. You can handle it the same way they did. And you're going to be amazed at what God does when you handle it the way they did. Stick with, stick with me. You may say, look, I have been praying about my situation and it's not getting any better. I've tried that prayer stuff and I don't see any improvement. Some of you can say that. Some of you can say the other two. Say, well, I prayed and boy, did God step in and fix it. Things are still bad, maybe. There's no improvement. If I've been praying and He hasn't improved anything, how can I praise Him in this mess? He's not answering my prayers. How can I praise Him? You may say, Brother Allen, you tell me I ought to praise God even when He's not answering my prayers even when things are the darkest and the worst and the nastiest they could possibly be, even when I'm hurting, I'm hurting bad because I have been beaten up one way or another, maybe not physically, but maybe mentally and emotionally. You're telling me I ought to praise God? What do I have to praise God about? I heard your question. Here comes the answers. Are you ready? What do I have to praise God about? Every single one of you woke up this morning. Somebody said, I'm on the right side of the grass. <laughs> woke up this morning. You're alive. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. You're healthy enough to be here. You've got enough strength to be here. What do you ought to do? Praise God. Praise God. How'd you get here? Walk or did you ride in the car? You had transportation that got you here. Praise God for that transportation. Almighty God loves you. Maybe you haven't thought about it in a while, but Almighty God loves you and He's patient with you. Praise Him. If He were not patient with you and did not love you, He could squash you like a bug. Me too. But He doesn't. You're still here. Praise Him for God for not squashing me like a bug. For not ending my life. You could take it away at any moment, but you haven't. Thank you. Does God really love you? Of course He does. He proved it on a cross 2,000 years ago. Praise Him for Jesus taking your place on the cross. Praise Him for it. You say, well, okay. Well, if you praise Him for the knowledge of what Jesus did for you, that's one thing. But if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior and you've been saved, you've got a lot more to praise Him about. Amen. You're not just full of the knowledge of what Jesus has done. You're not just full of the knowledge of how much God loves you. You have experienced His love personally because you received His Son as your Lord and your Savior. Every one of your sins are forgiven. You ought to be praising Him. Amen. He's given you eternal life. You ought to be praising Him. Praise Him. You say, well, I'm still in the darkness. Hang on, it's not over yet. Keep praising Him. If you're God's blood-bought, born-again child, you've got a lot to praise Him about. Because you've got a home in your Father's house waiting for you. Praise Him for it. You're not living in it now, but the day will come when you shall, if you're God's child, you may not be in perfect health and your bank account may not be overflowing, but praise Him anyway. So, oh, Brother Allen, you don't know about my health issues. No, I don't. God does. Can I tell you the Apostle Paul and Silas were not in perfect health either? <laughs> oh, no, they weren't. Can you imagine? They beat them half to death. They weren't in perfect health. And what about their financial situation? They had nothing. As far as we can tell, they were either in their underwear or nothing at all in that prison. They had no pockets. They had no money. They were penniless. And yet they praised God. You've obviously got something. Maybe not a lot, but you got a little. Maybe you're not paying your bills like you want to and should. But you've got something. Praise Him. Here's the interesting part about this verse. Not only did they pray and not only did they sing praises unto God, the other prisoners heard them. You see, when we praise God, it's not for His benefit. 
And it's not totally for our benefit, although it is for our benefit. It's for the benefit of those around us as they hear us praise God in our circumstances. Y'all did some beautiful singing this morning. And, and Mr. Jerry sang a fantastic song this morning. The, you were worshiping, were you not? You were praising God. And when you heard somebody else praising and you heard the choir singing back at you, you're getting blessed. When we are praising God, it's not just for our benefit, it's for those around us who hear us praise God. Because you know what? They're in the same darkness we're in. They're the same in the world that we live in. And they need to praise God in spite of it. And when they hear you praising, they may look up to the very one that you're praising and say, oh, you know what? He loves me too. I just took my eyes off the Lord for too long and put them on myself and I put them on my troubles and my problems and I forgot how good God is. But I'm going to praise Him anyway. In other words, you'll be helping somebody else to do what you're doing, praying and praising God. So let me encourage you. Be a blessing to somebody else. Praise Him. The next thing I want you to know about this, there is tremendous power in prayer and praise. I mean real power. Not just, well, God's going to fix my problem. No, no, no. Real power in prayer. How much power is there in prayer and praise? Well, we're just going to take this one instance because the Bible's full of it. But right here, it, this one time, Paul and Silas and the prison in Philippi praying and praising God. And let's see God's power. What God can do. I want to tell you something. He can shake the planet for you. Read the next verse. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors popped open and everyone's bands were loose. You think there wasn't power in that prayer? And God said, I hear you. Hang on. I'm about to shake this planet for you. I'm going to show you how I can open prison doors. I'm going to show you how I can take the shackles off, but I'm going to get the world's attention. I'm going to shake this planet. God can shake the planet in response to your prayers and praise if you'll pray and praise Him. Yeah. We're too silent for too long and say, I wonder why God's not doing anything. I don't know. There's a lot in this. God was listening to their prayers and, and He was listening to them when they praised Him and He responded. Isn't that what our world needs today? Don't we need to pray and praise God and watch Him respond? You know, we, we've heard a lot about earthquakes like in Turkey and other places. But those had a very negative effect. But an earthquake can have a very positive effect if it pops you out of prison, sets you free. We're hearing other reports about God responding to prayers and praise. Asbury, Kentucky, I had I never heard of it a month ago, and neither did you probably. Man, but it's national news, it's worldwide news on what God's doing and has been doing for weeks as people praise Him and pray and wouldn't stop, wouldn't quit, wouldn't slow down 24-7. They just kept it up. And then what God was doing in response to that is He was blessing people. That movement moved on to other places. It went from there to another college and another one and another one and across America and all over the United States. There's various places where the similar events are taking place where people are just saying, we're stopping what we're doing. All we're going to do is pray and we're going to praise God and see what He does. And God's shaking the world. He's shaking their planet. He is responding to their intense praying and worshiping and praising. And you know what he's doing? He is breaking the chains of bondage off of people who have been in bondage to the enemy. I mean, he's setting some folks free. No doubt he's healing some people physically. But listen, your physical ailment is nothing compared to your spiritual ailment if you're lost on your way to hell. Yeah. And some people are being saved. Yeah. Isn't that what it's all about? But they weren't before. They weren't before. Some of these college campuses, they were state-owned and state-operated, and there wasn't a drop of spirituality in any of them, as far as anybody could tell. 
But when people started praying and praising God, he began to respond. Asbury, it, it's, can I tell you, the reputation that school used to have, other than they had one of these right Bibles some years back, was a very liberal, spiritually dead Methodist college. <laughs> My opinion. And opinion of a lot of others. And all of a sudden, God showed up. Wow. He began moving people out of the darkness of their dungeons and into, their li into His light and saving souls. There's power in prayer and praise when God responds. It's His power that comes to focus. And that's what's happening. That's what happened in the prison at Philippi. Oh, a little more dramatic maybe. None of our buildings have fallen down or doors popped open or anything like that. But a lot of people have been set free the same. If you remember in Philippi, even the jailer got saved. Lord willing, we'll get to him next week. Here in Lake Charles, couldn't we stand it? Isn't there enough darkness here that we cry out for the light? Aren't there enough Christians here that say, God, I know how much you love me. I'm going to praise you no matter what in spite of everything that's going on negative in my life. I'm going to praise you anyway because I love you, because you love me. Aren't there enough Christians to do that? Aren't there enough Christians to say, hey, we're going to set aside a time for real prayer. And I don't mean now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> oh, no. I don't mean thank you, God, for the food I eat. I don't mean looking at the prayer list on Wednesday night where you've got 100 people named who are sick and you don't even know who they are. You've got 40 people on there that are lost and you're praying for their salvation, supposedly praying for their names are on there, but we don't know who they are. We're not really praying for them. We've got them on the list. And then the backside's got more prayer requests. Oh, no, no, I'm talking about real prayer. I'm talking about where we just open our hearts to God totally and completely saying, God, put that prayer in my heart that you want me to pray for your glory so that you can respond the way you want to respond. Don't be limited by a page in front of me. Don't be limited by my habit of prayer or prayerlessness. Oh, Father, help us. Help us to pray the way we should. You say, well, all that stuff that's happening around the country, it's questionable how real it is and everything else. And I, I don't have the answer to that. But do you think there's a possibility that God might be wanting to send a great heaven-sent revival to Lake Charles. I mean, one that's unexplainable except God's doing something He's not done here before. I mean, people, all of a sudden, people are falling in love with God. People can't get enough of church. People can't get enough of the Word of God and, and prayer and fellowship and praising and worshiping. Wouldn't you love to see something like that happen here? If God could do it in Philippi, and if He can do it other places, God's not limited by location. He can do it here too. And if He is willing to do it here, we've got to be wondering, why not? What's He waiting for? Is He waiting for that one special Christian to start praying earnestly with all they've got? for God to send that kind of a revival to Lake Charles. For that one Christian who would get with another Christian and say, forget what's going on in the world, let's just praise God because of who He is. And then another, and another, and another. One church that would be willing to pray and praise God until the earth shakes and the doors pop open, the shackles fall off, and people are set free. You suppose God just might be waiting for us? If He is, maybe we need to stop making God wait. Maybe it's time for us to say, Lord, if you're waiting on me, you don't have to wait any longer. I'm going to start praying this morning like I've never prayed before. I'm going to start praising you like I've never praised you before. I, I saw what you did in Philippi and in and other places too. And if you're waiting on me, God, and I'm not doing what I need to do to get out of the way, I'm cheating those people around me. I don't want to do that. 
I'd like to see you set some folks free, some people that I know, people that I love that need to be delivered and set free. Lord, if you're waiting on me, start with me. Start that revival with me today. We're going to give an invitation to come to the altar and pray. Because I think that's what God would have us to do. I don't know what he's put on your heart. You may be saying, oh, that's for somebody else that's not for me. Okay, that's fine. Or maybe you're one of those individuals that need to be like the people that were on the street listening to Paul and Silas hear about the Lord Jesus dying on a cross for you. Maybe you've never got to the point that you've trusted him as your Lord and your Savior. You've never been saved. This would be a great day for you. If you'll just repent of your sins and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you and become the Lord and Master of your life, He'll do it. He's waiting for you. Your invitation. Let's pray. Father, I honestly don't know how to end the message other than that we're seeking your perfect will to be done. Oh, Father, I pray first of all for anybody that's here today that is not absolutely certain that when they die, they'll go to heaven. They're not absolutely certain they're saved. Oh, Father, anybody, I pray for them that you'll speak to their heart and let them know the truth that they need to be forgiven. They need to trust your son, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior because he died in their place on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. And he's in heaven right now waiting to save them if they'll just call on him. Oh, Father, for per people that are here like that, I pray they'll not hesitate that when we begin to sing that song, they'll just come. And they'll say, Brother Allen, I want to be saved today. I know you're ready to save them. And Father, for the rest of us, we do have a longing in our hearts to see a revival like we've described. To see you do a great and mighty work. If that means shaking the planet, shake it. If that means popping open prison doors and breaking shackles off people and setting them free, oh God, please. Father, help us to get out of the way if you're waiting for us to worship you and praise you and pray the way we should. Thank you now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.